Cool, thank you. Uh, so quick thank you to the organisers for having me speak and uh, everyone for coming out on a Saturday. Um, it's quite late where I am, but I imagine it's quite early for some of you as well. So without further ado, I'm going to be talking about the gromov lerson rosenberg conjecture on positive scalar curvature. Um, so scalar curvature, if we have a manifold M with a Riemannian metric G, the scalar curvature essentially is kind of a local property which is going to compare the volume of balls in this manifold to the volume of balls in Euclidean end space. So precisely, we're going to take the trace of the Ricci tensor. But if, if you don't know what this is, just kind of think of this idea of we're looking at how curved the space is. So um, it's measuring at every single point the curvature, basically. Uh, so two easy examples. The Euclidean space has curvature equal to zero. And the sphere of radius r, the n-sphere of radius r, has curvature equal to n, mi n minus 1 over r squared. So we can normalize this so that we can just say the sphere has constant scalar curvature equal to 1. Um, and notice here that the, the, the scalar curvature is constant. Um, in general, this won't be true. It'll be a given value at a specific, uh, a specific point. But we can kind of ask, is it always greater than 0 or always less than 0 or always equal to 0? So for instance, the Euclidean space there has it always equal to 0. And this kind of gives a very natural question, which is, when does a manifold admit a metric of positive scalar curvature? And we're going to denote the curvature by kappa. Um, and we're going to think of this as kind of like an integral over the manifold, and it's the sum of all the curvature. OK, so in dimension two, this is actually completely solved. Uh, so if we go all the way back to gauss bonnet the gauss bonnet theorem, if m is a, is a compact surface, then the scalar curvature is equal to 4 pi times the Euler characteristic. Um, and this is possibly quite surprising because the Euler characteristic is a topological feature of a space rather than a geometric feature because scalar curvature is definitely something out of differential geometry. And yet here, the obstruction to it lies very deeply rooted in topology. I mean, the Euler characteristic is an alternating count of cells. So this is quite, quite a surprising fact. And um, so, so here you can see immediately if it's a hyperbolic surface, so one of genus at least two, then this value is negative because the Euler characteristic is negative. And if, this va if you have a torus, then this value is zero. So again, you can't have positive scalar curvature. Um, as we saw, the sphere does emit a metric of constant positive scalar curvature. And here, that invariant becomes positive. So maybe we can try and generalize this idea of finding a topological obstruction to a geometric problem. And you might ask, what about higher dimensions? So before we can do that, we kind of have to go take a trip through functional analysis very quickly. Uh, don't worry too much about the details, but essentially we're going to define a couple of things. We're going to get some machinery out and then the machinery is going to get increasingly complicated, but the goal is still the same to find a topological obstruction. So if M is a closed spin manifold and X is a spin or bundle, we want to consider the space of L2 sections from M to X. So this is the space of uh, functions from M to X, which are a section to the bundle and they're square integrable. Um, don't worry too much about what this object is, but it's some kind of space with functional analysis like and it's quite easy to get a handle on. We're going to let D be the Dirac operator on this, on this uh, space, this L2 space. Um, again, if you don't know what this is, don't worry too much. But a very important fact is that the square of it is equal to the Laplacian plus kappa over 4, where this is our curvature. Now, if the Laplacian, the Laplacian is always greater than or equal to 0. So essentially, we found some, some object. We've, we've taken some object and we've got some operator which is kind of picking up curvature. Um, at the moment, this is still very much in the realm of geometry, and we, we're not really looking at the topology, but we're going to get to how they connect. So if kappa is greater than zero, this d squared is now invertible. So d is invertible. So we can define an index, which is going to be the dimension of the kernel of d minus the dimension of the co-kernel. And of course, if d is invertible, then this is zero, because the dimension of the kernel and the dimension of the co-kernel are zero. So uh, the corollary of this, due to, originally due to Lichnarowitz, is that if the index is non-zero, then M cannot admit a metric with a positive scalar curvature. But this, we're still in the realm of functional analysis here. We haven't, we're not in the realm of topology yet. So uh, quite a famous result due to Atiyah and Singer is the Atiyah-Singer index theorem, which states that if M is a closed spin 4K manifold, then the index is equal to this A hat genus of the manifold. 
Now, this is some quite high powered topological gadget which you get out of the characteristic classes in the cohomology of M. But the point is, is it's something you can compute. If you're given like a CW structure on a manifold, you can just sit there and you can, in principle, you can work out what this thing is. You can just sit there and compute it, and then you know whether you're going to emit positive scalar curvature or not. Admittedly, it's a lot harder to compute than the Euler characteristic, but it is computable. So that's kind of what we want. We want something which is very canonical to the topology of the space and not to the uh, geometry. Okay, so how do we get more general? Because we know that this was only in dimensions 4K. So uh, Rosenberg introduced something called the alpha invariant. And this one's a bit more, a bit more tricky to digest. But essentially, we're going to take a closed spin n manifold and g a discrete group. We're going to take any map from the manifold to BG, the classifying space. And then if m admits a metric of positive scalar curvature, the class, which somehow ends up in this real k group of the group C star algebra, um, is going to vanish. Now, this class begins life in the spin borders and group, and it factors through a bunch of different maps. But the key point is there is some class which has to vanish. So to break this down a bit, a bit more nicely, we, we have a class which lives in some homological invariant of a group, and it vanishes whenever there's a metric of positive scalar curvature. So it is an obstruction. And in fact, it coincides with the index of that Dirac operator we had before. Um, OK, so this is great. When, when is this enough? Um, oh, and actually, one more thing to properly get back into the realm of topology, because uh, the K north K of a real C star algebra is still kind of an analytical thing. Uh, bon Kearns identifies this with this uh, interesting looking thing which is essentially a kind of the finite subgroup version of EG. And we're going to take the equivariant K theory. And this is something which you can compute. It's just the difficulty becomes more because the, the invariants more complicated. But it's something which, again, you can sit down, you can work this out for a given group. You can work out what the equivariant KO of E, e under bar or E fin G is. Um, this has a simpler statement though if G is torsion free. Here it just says that the real K theory of BG uh, is isomorphic with a natural map to uh, the real K theory of the group, C reduced group C star algebra. Now again, this is kind of, there's a lot going on here, but essentially we have something which lives in a topological invariant, a class, and we just want to know whether that class is zero or not. So it's, it's something we can work out. Um, just the difficulty increases. Uh, the von Kern's conjecture is known to hold for a lot of groups. So this is kind of any group which you might consider the setting for um, positive scalar curvature. It's probably known that the von Kern's conjecture is satisfied. Uh, so for example, hyperbolic groups, uh, relatively hyperbolic groups, cat zero cubical groups, finite groups. <coughs> These are all known to satisfy this. So most kind of natural groups you would consider. Um, okay. So how can we turn this into something which is more general? Uh, the idea is that we take a closed spin n manifold again, and we're going to only consider maps which induce an, an identity on the fundamental group of the manifold. And then the conjecture is that you only need to consider these maps. So, it, so if the class vanishes now, um, then G has a metric, a positive scalar curvature, and if the class doesn't vanish, then it's not. So it's kind of like the necessary and sufficient condition. So um, hopefully the idea is that this is the only topological obstruction we need to consider. Uh, so when has this conjecture been verified? Well, it's known for all simply connected. M. It's known when uh, the fundamental group of M is finite with periodic cohomology. So this is kind of uh, things like cyclic groups, uh, generalized quaternion groups, uh, SL2P, um, so quite a few finite groups, but not a huge amount. And uh, also it's known when G is torsion free and the dimension of G is at least is less than nine. And then finally, the only infinite groups uh, which have torsion where it seems to be known for are Fuchsian groups. And uh, there is also a counterexample due to Thomas Schick with pi when m equal to z to the four direct sum z3. So it's not it's not satisfied by everything. Um, you, can, you can find manifolds where this isn't, it doesn't characterize positive scalar curvature. It is just an obstruction. So um, if I had more time, I would talk about Thomas Schick's example because it's really nice, but unfortunately I don't. So uh, my little 
add on to this is if g is either PSL 2z1 over p for p congruent to 11 mod 12 or a lattice in PSL 2c with all finite subgroups cyclic, then g also satisfies this conjecture. So if you take a manifold with one of these fundamental groups, uh, dimension at least five, then you can just look at this k, k, real k group and you can look at the image of this class through a bunch of maps, which you can work out quite explicitly. And then if this class vanishes, then you know that these groups admit a metric of positive scalar curvature. So, so for a really simple example, if you take any manifold with dimension congruent to three or five mod eight, then uh, the manifold will admit a metric positive scalar curvature if its fundamental group is PSL 2 z one over P. So that's kind of a quick application of this theorem. Um, so, I mean, my immediate question is why only P mod 12? Uh, why is P only congruent to 11 mod 12? Um, so I'll say a few words about that and then we'll wrap up. So a group G has property M if every finite subgroup is contained in a unique maximal finite subgroup and NM if every maximal finite subgroup is self-normalizing. So these are kind of group theoretic properties um, and they turn out to be quite important in the proof. So PSL 2Z1 over P only satisfies M and NM when P is congruent to 11 mod 12. Essentially, this comes from the way these groups can be realized as fundamental groups of graphs of groups. Um, if you're not familiar with that, then just kind of black box this along with everything else I've said. But um, the idea then is that when G satisfies these two properties, M and NM, the, there's a spectral sequence due to Davis and Luke, which is uh, quite useful. You can compute stuff very explicitly with it and it kind of collapses quite nicely. Um, so the proof then, we, we get a diagram which gets quite complicated. Um, and this diagram is, is directly follows from having those properties N, 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 uh, and N, M. Uh, but we're not gonna worry too much about what, where this comes from because you could spend a long time <laughs> discussing this diagram. But I'll mention a couple of things. So the map P is the connective cover. Uh, if you know about connective cover as a spectra, and the sum is over finite conjugacy classes. Um, but again, this is, this is kind of technical, so I don't want to dwell on this too much. Um, oh, and X is the, this classifying space for proper actions, which we saw earlier, but we're going to quotient out by the G action. So in the case of PSL 2Z1 over P, this actually turns out to be a wedge of spheres, um, which is, I, I mean, it's a very nice space. It's quite easy to see that P is going to be an isomorphism once you know about connective covers. Okay, so this kind of hints at a more general theorem, which is if G satisfies M, N, M, the bomb cones conjecture, and all finite subgroups of the cyclic, uh, if X is this space E fin G over G, then P and this connective map is an isomorphism, this connective cover, sorry, for all n greater than equal to five, then G satisfies the GLR conjecture. So this gives a lot of examples of groups with torsion which now satisfy this. And um, it's perhaps worth interesting to note that if we go all the way back to Thomas Schick's example with z to the four plus a, a direct sum z mod three, uh, the whole group normalizes z mod three. So it doesn't satisfy at, uh, m. Yeah, nm, sorry, it doesn't satisfy nm. Now, whether this is actually the obstruction to this, I don't want to say, but clearly, the example where it's not known, this is a, it doesn't satisfy NM. Um, so maybe that's interesting, I'm not sure. Okay, so my open question is, does PSR 2Z1 over P satisfy the conjecture for other primes? And I have no idea whether it does or not, but uh, I would love to know the answer. So thank you for listening. Give Sammy a round of applause. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say that part. I just started clapping. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, any questions for Sam? I have a quick question. Ooh, yeah. So um, you made like a like a passing comment about something about fundamental groups of um, graphs of groups. Could you uh, just say a sentence or two more about that? Yeah, sure. So um, PSL 2Z1 over P is an amalgamated free product of PSL 2Z over a principal congruent subgroup. So apart from for P equals 2 and 3, these are just free groups. 
So then it's a push out of like graphs. So you, that's how you get the wedge of spheres, basically, for E end of RG. Um, I see. So could, could you say something more about, um, like if, if, I, if I gave you um, a group that I knew was a fundamental group of, of a graph of groups, um, could it like fit into this narrative in some um, way? So you'd want to be amalgamated, if it has torsion, you definitely don't want to be amalgamating over a subgroup with torsion. So all of your edge groups would have to be torsion free. Um, and then it's really a case of whether the groups, uh, the spaces involved already satisfy this covering thing. So if they're all kind of low dimensional groups, then they probably do. So, so um, you kind of get like most three manifold groups and three all fold groups from this, which is nice. Great, thanks.